event. We thought this happens about um, every thousand years or so. And it may be that's true for things that are a size maybe of a kilometer, but apparently things that are sizes of maybe only 100 or 200 meters maybe happen as frequently as every few tens of years or so. In any case, uh, this is us gathered around the screen here when the first fragment, that comet was broken into two dozen fragments, and those fragments hit one after the, the other. Uh, this is us, uh, there I am with much darker hair, um, gathered to see the first uh, fragment here about to hit. And then this is what we saw. This is the limb of Jupiter. And as we followed this, a point of light appeared, and then it became brighter and higher, and then it became like a mushroom, and that mushroom collapsed onto Jupiter. Basically what happened is the fragment went in, material came back out from there, from the exploding fragment of comet and some of Jupiter's atmosphere material, and it formed something like a mushroom cloud, almost like a nuclear explosion, and we were able to watch this as it happened. And eventually, it left scars in all the places where the fragments hit on Jupiter. Uh, and those fragments, actually, some of them lasted for as long as a few months. Now, I hope all of you heard, but at least uh, some of you probably heard, that a comet just hit Jupiter a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, actually, right now, in the middle of commissioning Hubble after the last servicing mission, but these are such unique events that we actually stopped all activity and watched it. I mean, actually gave time for Hubble to observe it. We've never done something like this in the middle of uh, orbital uh, verification. Uh, but here it is. And we observed the spot. Here is all of Jupiter. Here is the spot. You can see how similar it is to previous hits uh, from this. In this case, this was, of course, discovered by a an Australian amateur who, who, who first discovered it, uh, but Hubble gave this very high resolution image of this impact of this thing, and we actually have a couple of more visits to see this as this uh, thing is gonna spread out. So this is really ho literally hot. You see the observation, uh, the impact hap happened uh, uh, July 19 uh, of this year. Uh, stellar life and death, very quickly, uh, this star brightened up in 2002. Uh, it was a large pulse of light. Light from it propagated, as, and as light propagated, it illuminated farther and farther regions. So this is what we see here. Nothing is expanding here. It's just light propagating and illuminating the surrounding. We observe this every few months, and this is what it looked like. We observe it now seven times. This, I showed you five here of this star V838 Ma. When stars like the sun die, they form these beautiful shapes we call planetary nebulae. I'm just showing you a few images. This is the Eskimo. Uh, this is Cat's Eye. Absolutely stunning images of this thing. Uh, the Ant Nebula. And uh, this, when more massive stars explode, this is the Crab Nebula, the result of a supernova explosion in the 11th century was actually observed by Korean, Japanese, Chinese, and Native American, let's call them astronomers, or at least observers of the time. Just before servicing mission four, uh, we took a few images with our old workhorse, Widefield Planetary Camera 2. I just want to show you those. Uh, so here they are. This one we called Fountain of Youth both because this looks like drops of water, but also because these are actually uh, clusters of very young stars. Uh, this was, some of you may know about our You Decide contest, where we ask the public to vote on one of six targets that Hubble will observe. This was the target that was chosen, and we observed it, and it produced a spectacular image. This is one of the very last images taken by Whitefield Camera 2. And this is an image taken after uh, we have this electronics board that stopped working and for about a month the telescope wasn't working. When it came back to life, I suggested observing this because I already saw in my head the title we will give to this observation. We said, upon returning to work, Hubble scores a perfect 10. 
and the, we, we, we did this uh, with that image of uh, actually two colliding galaxies. This galaxy was actually completely stretched into a spiral uh, that formed these images. Now we had this servicing mission, and I'll just show you three or four images from that. Here is a very unusual site. Because of the perceived risk to a mission to Hubble, two shuttles had to be on launch pads at the same time. Uh, this is something that you know, does not happen on launches to space station. So two shuttles ready to go, both Atlantis and Endeavour. The shuttle launched. We, I was there. It, it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, and these are the astronauts uh, working on Hubble. Uh, the person here is John Grunsfeld, who has been to Hubble three times. Um, so he's, uh, he's the real Hubble hugger. He's the person who actually got to hug Hubble uh, 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 quite a few times. And then they released the telescope, and this is the picture of the released telescope just immediately after the shuttle released it back into orbit. And the shuttle, of course, landed safely. And we had the astronauts, the crew, visit us last week. So they've installed two new instruments. They have repaired two existing instruments. Hubble has actually its largest complement of working instruments it has ever had. So of course, we're looking for all of these to be continued. Thank you. For any okay. Okay. I was curious when you look at globular clusters and and ask about their dynamics, is there any particular interesting metric for dark matter there to play a role in the dynamics of globular clusters? And is this smaller scale measure interesting? Not particularly about dark matter. I mean, uh, what, there are interesting things about them. First of all, they are some of the oldest objects in the universe. Second, they may harbor intermediate mass black holes. And in fact, there has been a suggestion already in two clusters that maybe one such black hole has been observed. Usually, when observed closer, those turned out not to be true, or at least not certainly to be true. So in terms of dark matter, there, are, there is dark matter, of course, surrounding all structures that form. Uh, but there is nothing particularly um, you know, more interesting about dark matter around globular clusters than there is around galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Okay, one, one other question. When you observe an infrared with Hubble, will that give you a, a follow-on correlating database between Hubble and the Webb telescope? Yes, well, with, with some luck, you see, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is currently scheduled to be launched in 2014. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, is scheduled to work for at least five years following the servicing mission, which brings you to 2014. But everybody agrees that if the instruments will work perfectly, there is no reason not to extend Hubble's life to, you know, six, seven, eight years. So we may even have a potential for overlapping of the two telescopes. And then we will have fantastic coverage all the way from ultraviolet to you know, the farther infrared. And because Hubble is still very near infrared, um, the James Webb Sp Space Telescope will go into the mid-infrared. So I I this will be absolutely outstanding if, right. if it will happen. And you would then have the opportunity to cross-calibrate the two instruments, I presume. Well, it's, it's not just a matter of calibration. I mean, there are some things where you absolutely need this coverage to see everything that's, that's happening and to tell you about the physical processes. It's like the difference between our eyes seeing only the color green or seeing all the colors that we see. Thank you. Uh, um, great talk. Um, I just had a quick question about the beginning of your talk about speaking of dark matter. Um, you had mentioned that we don't really know what it's composed of. Uh, but there may be some exotic particles that it may be composed of. Are there any leading macho or WIMP candidates for that? Yeah, so the leading uh, particle candidate for dark matter are things